So those of you who have used the product probably know that performance is something that we take highly, uh, that we think highly about. We tweak things uh, at, the, at the hardware level and we make sure that our users get millisecond results uh, when they do queries. We, ch we have a really fast, uh, real-time, almost real-time analytics for all of our users, which roll rolls data per five minutes. So we can build on top of that. So we have this big opinion on performance. How do we index all that data for the users that it's accessible? And those of you who have used it probably have an idea about how it looks like. This is kind of the way it looks like when you search on IMDB database. So it's really fast. But two years ago, uh, I joined a company and uh, I really like web performance. And what happened was everyone in the company kept telling me, you know, we're a really fast engine. We do all these types of optimizations and things. And then I go to the website, to our own website, and I try to load it, and it loaded really fast. And I'm like, I use it on 3G, and it took 16 seconds to load. And nobody really looked at that. Because the thing is, everyone was on office Wi-Fi, and, you know, that's pretty good. It was also the first time I saw someone break Lighthouse. Uh, if you look at the performance, uh, there's a big question mark. It was the first time it, we did it. And honestly, the team moved so fast that you cannot blame them. They had different uh, priorities to do it. But as you move forward, these things are important for our users. Because if we want to have an opinion on performance, we cannot just say we do it, right? There's certain ways we have to justify it and have an opinion on what we're doing. So this talk is going to be about how we went from uh, about 16 second load time to some really good load times. And I sub-second probably not the best here, but really fast. And in the talk overview, I really want to explain to you some of the optimizations that we've done from handling different assets, lazy loading, using stuff like Brotly or WebP, doing network optimizations, uh, and finally finding some hidden bottlenecks that we've had and how we actually improved the runtime optimization uh, of the code, making sure that the main thread was idle and we could not have an input delay. But I think when you start a project like this, it's kind of like cleaning this car. It's this dirty place of, of things that you have to clean. So you start by doing the, the things that have the biggest impact. And you, you go with some of the tools that you have. For instance, in this case, it was the, the Lighthouse tool and the web page test, which give you a really good overview of where you stand. So one of the first things I did was have a look at how, what are the asset sizes? What are the things that, like, are we using bundlers? Uh, how are we splitting the code and things like that? And you'd be shocked uh, to see some things uh, that I found. Uh, for instance, loading an entire D3 library for a site that's on like fifth level to load a map uh, into your main bundle, things like that. So we started trimming down things, removing stuff like jQuery, uh, uh, Bootstrap, uh, things like this. So this is kind of a similar example. You can use the native API, the native DOM element selecting API, or you can use uh, a jQuery, right? So they're kind of the same. One of them is going to give you a node list, and the other one is going to give you the jQuery representation of what it found. And you're going to have some issues with that if you want to do for each and things like this. So be careful with that. But there's a bigger difference. And the bigger difference is you've saved about 30 kilobytes of size just by dropping jQuery. And you've dropped a lot of parsing and evaluating time. Because of course, every library you load comes with a cost, not just the size cost. It comes with the cost of instantiating objects internally, blocking your main thread, and things like this that have been discussed in, uh, in very good detail in the, in the previous talk. So you've saved about 70 milliseconds of script evaluation time with about 30 kilobytes of JavaScript. To give you an idea, before this looked something like this. This is how the main thread looked like after we load our code. So you see that the JavaScript is evaluated and the whole thread is busy doing uh, its thing for in internally, so it's ready when you have to use it. But when you drop that, all of a sudden you have nothing anymore. Uh, there are some things you still have, but the evaluation is shorter, there's no, there's no more noise, and there is no more input delay, which means that your users can start using the website, right? 
So this was something, this was probably the biggest win we did for JavaScript, right? Um, and something we did, we did something for CSS as well. So imagine you have this thing. Um, you have a layout and you have a similar layout. They're all the same, but you're using BEM-like syntax, which means you're gonna try and scope your classes because these things are two different uh, components, maybe. And this is how you're gonna write your style. So you're gonna use two different classes and you're gonna essentially do the same thing with two different classes. Now, imagine you're not using any of like styled components or things like that, so there's nothing, nothing like tree shaking that would allow you to reap the benefits of, of, minif of actually optimizing this code. So we reach for something that's like uh, atomic CSS. First, when you think about it, you're like, oh, this HTML is ugly. But in the end, when you kind of get the feeling, it's actually quite nice. And it actually scales for us pretty well. So you have the same layout, but you just use a single class to describe it uh, with a single CSS property. And that's not 30 kilobytes difference, right? But it's 30 bytes, multiply it with the number of occurrences, and you get something. Now, one of the things I've seen when I was looking at the website was we had a lot of images. Because, uh, of course, it's a marketing kind of website. We're selling things. We want our users to understand uh, what we have. And so the problem was I've seen images being resized uh, down to 50% of their size and things like that. And it's a huge waste, something that was really well talked to before. We're wasting so much bandwidth by loading wrong images images that are too large, and nobody wants a high-density photo uh, somewhere on your screen just because you don't even have a high-density uh, computer. So I think this is something that, if you often find yourself resizing images, you're probably not using the right sizes. So you should invest your time in looking into that. And a quick example would be, this is my coworker, Ben. Uh, so he has a passion for fried chicken, but that's Different issue. Uh, second photo, uh, we just resize it. So we're down to 30 kilobytes, almost down half the size. And we compress it with WebP, and we're at 20 kilobytes. So we've went from 55 to 21 kilobytes on a single image. And so Algolia has about 300 employees, and the About page has about 300 people. So you multiply 300 people by about 30 kilobytes on average, and that's going to be a lot. But WebP, right? Uh, so what is WebP? Uh, probably some of you have heard about it. Actually, how many of you have heard about WebP? Well, okay. So how many of you have used it in production, actually? Okay. Okay. Smaller number, but good. So the question is, how do you enable WebP? And what is it good for? So it's a new type of, of image format. And the thing is, I've seen people from going to try and implement WebP on the client to detecting, hey, do we have WebP support and doing things like that. But please don't do that. Uh, you have a header that's, you, that's actually um, made exactly for that. So if you control your own servers, you can do that. Uh, if you use a good CDN, on the other hand, it might be just a click of a button. You set up the compression ratio that you want, either lossy or lossless and you're gonna have WebP just like that, transparently. So this comes at a cost, right? This comes at a cost of controlling which assets you wanna, you wanna actually deliver minified and which ones you wanna keep. So WebP is all good. Small sizes, everything's better, right? Turns out WebP can be weird in cases where you might want to download images of, of your brand you're, you might want to have someone say, hey, uh, I'm trying to download your logo, and trust me, we've had people try to do that. Uh, they, were, they said, we're trying to download your logo from your website, but w th we haven't seen this format yet, which makes sense. They're not technical people. They don't know that it's a WebP format. So you're gonna have to probably have some exclusion, exclusion rules to that, and depending on how you want to tackle it, I'll let you decide what you want to do. So, We've managed to compress the, the images down to what we need. What do we, where do we go next, right? So have some of you heard about Brotly? Cool. How many use it? Yeah. OK. So Brotly is uh, a new compression format. Uh, it's kind of, it gives you smaller sizes uh, in, term, in, in some cases. 
Um, but a lot of people are going to tell you, hey, you know, but broadly is slower when you decompress. Or, but that's kind of true and kind of not because it depends on, of course, the ratio of compression you're using. So for instance, Brotly is not really supported everywhere, but similar to WebP, it's going to give you a header with accept encoding Brotly if it's supported. And you can then decide, hey, if it's supported, we want to, we want to actually send Brotly formats back. And this is an example, uh, an index.html page, which is about 252 bytes on like regular uncompressed. And we use Brotly to compress it. We get it down to about 100 bytes. And if we use a gzip uh, kind of compression, we're at 160 bytes. So that's a substantial difference uh, that's, go that's going to have an impact on, on, on how you uh, serve assets. So similar to a lot of things, uh, you, you can have a simple setting or you, if you roll your own, if you roll your servers, of course, you're going to have to recompile Nginx with a new module. Uh, OK, that's not great. That's too wide. OK. Uh, but I wanted to say like something is really important, right? We've been focusing mainly on just the asset size right now, but just because something is a tiny asset doesn't mean it's all used. Uh, and I'm talking about marketing and tracking scripts where some, some vendors are going to tell you, hey, you can use it. It's a tiny, tiny JavaScript, you know? And then, no, you get a headache because you see all that water flow chart and... Uh, it's really bad. Because nobody in, in reality wants this, right? Nobody wants to have your website bloated by third party <coughs> trackers, right? But so use the, the Chrome coverage tool uh, if you're going to be doing that and isolate the cases um, where you're going to find vendors that are pushing dead code to your browser. And the thing is, this is something that it's going to be a fight. Uh, I don't mean a real fight, but it's something that you will have to face people with and tell them, hey, um, are, are we actually using this uh, tag manager or are we using Hotjar? Because maybe it's just there from the previous employee who used it for two weeks and, well, you know, he left. So I would really encourage you to get marketing teams on board, uh, on board this and, and talk to them and try to to make them think about web performance when they think about including JavaScript to your pages. But there is one thing that we should be doing as a community, I think. And we should be holding our, our third party providers uh, accountable for the code they ship to our pages. So the moment you see things like this, you should send them an email, tweet about it. Uh, they will sooner or later learn. To give you an idea, we, as an Algolia, we, we, we have JavaScript snippets that we send to people. We get things like that. We get requests from people saying, hey, it should be smaller. And we listen to those kind of things. We should be doing that more, especially for, for vendors. But I found a good trick to, to kind of uh, remove some of them. Um, but it might not make a lot of friends for you in the company. So, like, when you think about GDPR, right, you say, okay, GDPR, the moment it's personally identifiable, that, that vendor is a data processor, right? So it might happen that some of your tracking scripts are tracking too much. For instance, you're going to have scripts that are going to automatically track everyone, everywhere, and then you can segment what kind of data you need, right? But if there, if, if at, on your page you're displaying an email of your user some, like at their portal or something and you don't have that in your privacy policy that they're actually doing the data for you, you're kind of in a breach. Uh, so that's going to help you remove some of the things. But, but don't, for, don't force it because you're not going to make friends. So with, with these simple changes, we managed to like kind of get our website from about a good megabytes to something like 200 kilobytes with all the photos that we have. Something that you have to know is this size is, is not everything. Uh, there's different pages, like marketing pages, which usually have more photos. But if you know how to load things, it's still, it's still okay. You can kind of do that. But turns out the size is only a part of, of the equation and something that we've discussed today a lot is how do you also deliver those assets? How do the users actually know when something is fast? 
because most of the time, they will know if it's slow, but they won't have kind of a feeling if it's fast, right? Turns out, speed is kind of something we can fake, and that's what the resource hinting uh, allows us to do, and HTTP2 push, which allows us to push assets to the client faster, uh, but kind of keeping the, the same thing. So imagine this, uh, well, uh, imagine half of it. Uh, you have a load time, uh, but you want to increase the, the time to, to, to first paint so that users have, okay, something is at least happening. I'm going to stay here until they're, un unless they go, oh, nothing's happening. I'm just going to leave. And something I really like is, is this kid. Has anyone seen this before? No? So this kid was at a, a, an interview where they asked him, hey, how fast do you think you were going on the bike? He said, 30. 30 what? Speed, you know? <laughs> so, so think about how our users are going to also perceive your website and, and what's going to help them, right? So how can we do something like this? How can we improve uh, the rendering performance? So please use a, a good CDN. It will solve a lot of issues for you. Uh, one thing that's really nice is if you reduce the amount of critical requests, you're going to have you're going to improve the the load time, and you want to prioritize the critical assets. <laughs> if you can get that to like under seven, so you can keep the HTTP2 multiplexing and don't have to create new re uh, new requests, it's it's going to be pretty good. And the other part is you can have resource hinting and lazy loading. Uh, you don't have to load everything, and you can kind of indicate, hey, this is something you should be pushing. Uh, to the client, for instance, uh, a CSS file that you know they're going to need, but it's not there yet. And if it's not critical, it shouldn't block renders. Uh, if you have uh, a CSS file for a search box, because we we work at we work with search, it shouldn't block your website's render because it's a it's a secondary asset to the website. It's an addition to what you want to be shipping. And the second one is uh, the last one is you want to be caching things. Uh, now, don't cache everything, but uh, have some sort of uh, optimization. So this was what we've had before. Uh, so we've had three different domains, two different fonts. So familiar? Um, loading these things that are like not e I don't even want to say secondary to our website. Like, we don't even need them if the users don't click on the search bar and they want to search. So we l eliminated that to, to a single resource, basically to the style sheet that, that we need for the website. And the rest, uh, the rest we don't really need. And uh, tell your designers not to use five different fonts. Helps. Helps with consistency. But there is another thing. What I mentioned before is that if you have multiple domains, you're going to be paying the price for establishing a secure connection, a, t a TLS handshake. For instance, this is, okay, this is too big. Uh, the difference, if you see it on the left and on the right, uh, you see that there is a, a call to Google fonts being made, which is really, really, really expensive and blocking the load time, the paint time. So if you remove this, um, and you load the font in a different way or just use a font display property, uh, you can fix that and you're going to end up with something better. Now this you can't really see, but anyways, uh, your CDM providers are competing in a, in a tough market. So that means they'll follow new specifications really soon, uh, things that you, can, that you can use quickly. For instance, um, TLS 1.3 was released in August, I think, some of the CDM providers have already started adopting it, which means that you're going to get that zero, uh, zero round trip time uh, session resumption with TLS 1.3. So we've kind of covered how we can deliver assets in a, in a broad topic. Um, what about resource hinting? So a lot of you have heard about HTTP2 and how amazing it is and uh, multiplexing connections, binary um, format, header compression, and HTTP2 push, the holy grail of how we can fix things. So HTTP2 push is basically another stream that you send with the first request. So I request index.html. The server is going to open a stream, an asynchronous stream, even better, and it's going to start pushing some data to you. 
But turns out, not everything should be pushed because how do you know if, if the client already has that data in their cache? How do you know you're not pushing a resource that they already have and wasting time? So what if the client has already cached the files, right? So how do we say, all right, we don't want to push them anymore? The thing is, until now we've been, well, and still now we've been relying on kind of hacky implementations with cookies uh, to make sure we, we don't push the same assets again. But it's hard to maintain. Imagine having to maintain a cookie for, I don't know, 10 different pages uh, and it's different assets everywhere. And it also doesn't help your requests. So imperfect implementations are going to lead to wasted resources and negative impact on, on, on the page load, right? And uh, I remember yesterday talking to Rick, uh, how bad is HTTP2 push, right? Because we know that if you don't implement it properly, it's bad, but how bad is it actually? Something that I wanted to test uh, in the previous weeks, but I didn't really have the time. But Rick said something I think that's important. One HTTP2 push is, <coughs> bad HTTP2 push is essentially like eight good ones. So that's kind of the, the diminishing return of, of bad HTTP2 push. So I would say in general, it's better to push less than too much. Uh, you don't want to be, you don't want to be abusing the, the feature. And if you want to, you can still use the cookies. Uh, if, you ha if it's something simple, <laughs> go ahead, use it. We did and it worked fine. But turns out there is a new, fr new frame type that's, going to, that's in development. And uh, I know we have some folks, folks here from Akamai and uh, Fastly who are working on the spec. That's going to help the servers actually be able to digest what's in the cache and how they can work with that better. But so with push, you can indicate, hey, you're going to need these assets. Boom, you push it. And uh, you've eliminated some time to render. I think uh, this is going to be interesting because at about three weeks ago, I asked, uh, what do you think is interesting to talk about? What are some of the things? And notice that GraphQL was the last one. <laughs> but everyone is interested in what are some of the bad best practices uh, that you might have seen or might have actually uh, been doing yourselves that are hurting you. So. I've seen one of the things which was uh, pretty, impa pretty impactful and especially to us was that we were saving r like wrong requests. When I say wrong requests, I say we were trying to bundle everything into this one application.js file that had everything. And the rationality behind that was, yeah, but if we cache it, then it's instant for everyone else. Like, okay, we can do it, but what about like, what about the people that come to our site? It's gonna hurt everyone, right? So I would say don't save the code you don't need. Use, use bundlers because they're smart, they know how to split your code depending on how you, how you, how you can use it. And load what you need. Uh, when I say that, I mean, you know like uh, Webpack magic comments that load only the code that you need. Um, so things like that. One thing I found was actually very bad was base64 encoded images in CSS files um, or icons just because, I don't know, people like to base64 encode things. The problem with base64, right, is it's gonna generate larger files on average. So you're gonna have something like 35% larger file and even if you gzip that, uh, it's not gonna save anything for you. But the reason why it's really bad is because you've went from something that the browser can optimize and can look at and prioritize the way it wants and the way it thinks it should be done to something that's going to blow your CSS file. It's going to, uh, and it's going to create a render blocking asset out of a style sheet. For instance, if you encode an image into a style sheet, it's going to be super large and it's not gonna help you. Because by default, images are not render blocking, right? Uh, you can do, the browsers are gonna think about what they wanna do with them and will load them the way they think is appropriate, right? But the thing is you also lose any control over, over the network requests, right? Because all of a sudden now everything is in your CSS file and well, good luck with that. 
And so how do you optimize for different supports? How do you send a different image size or even a WebP image, right, uh, if it's supported? And I've also seen something like that come up in, in some of the icon fonts and some, some images. And sometimes you're going to say, you're going to see people say, oh yeah, but it's tiny, it's okay. It's, it's not okay. You don't have to do it. Then there is another problem that I found interesting. Um, at one point, I was looking at optimizations that we, are st we could do. Like I was trying to find things that we really haven't done and that we maybe can do. And at one point, I noticed, hey, like our index.html file is 75 kilobytes. Um, why? Like we, we had, the problem with that was that we were using, and that's probably our legacy issue, we were using something called inline SVG. Uh, we, were inlining, we were inlining SVGs to the document itself, which is kind of as bad as, as base 64 encoding images to CSS. So you're going to lose any control of, of being able to serve something uh, with like server-side optimizations, right? If we remove that, we, we, have, we have 16 kilobytes just dropping the hero SVG background and things like that, right? So next thing I think was interesting for us was uh, runtime optimizations. And when I say runtime optimizations, I don't mean this people fighting over is for each faster than a regular for loop? Should we use typed arrays and, and things like that? I don't think these are the kind of questions you should be asking yourself, right? Um, but I've seen people who try to do that in code reviews. Uh, don't do that, really, it's useless. The thing is, it probably doesn't matter because your code is suffering from bigger issues. You probably have uh, other types of, 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 of performance issues that you're doing. You're, for instance, and this might be interesting if I, can do, uh, if I can do some live profiling, but did you know you can animate stuff on a separate thread if you use canvas and workers? Uh, it's pretty recent, but maybe I can get this to run. An animation like, you can't see it, right? No, wait. So here, can I run it? No. That went far. No, all right, let's skip back. Wait a second. Okay. So let me skip back to this. The, the point of the idea is you can put stuff, if you're animating things on the canvas, you can actually put them in a different thread and you don't have to block the main thread with your 60 uh, FPS animation. Um, okay, I'll not be able to run it, but the idea is it's going to look something like, the difference is going to be something like this. This is a regular animation, a run at 50 frames per second on, on the main thread. And if you just move that to the off-screen support, you're going to be running the same code, but you're going to be running it on the, th on the web worker, and you won't be doing any damage to the main thread. Uh, so I think this is pretty interesting, and it's opening a lot of opportunities for, for, for web development to, to start to actually kind of do threaded uh, uh, code. And then there's things about, what about like scroll detection? Um, we've all written on scroll events uh, and then the magic get bounding client rect to try to find if an element is reaching the viewport. And those things are bad for multiple reasons. Because, first of all, because get bounding client rect is going to cause, I think it's, a, it's an operation, a paint operation, which you don't really have to be doing. And the thing is, it's also going to be uh, not reliable. And for a similar reason, uh, and I've done a small demo here, uh, if I can get it to run, so it doesn't run on the on the screen. Anyways, um, you can run a similar thing with with uh, with intersection observers, meaning that you can have scroll detection that's not running on the main thread, so you won't have the issue of <coughs> of blocking your main thread with executable code that you don't need. And there's a, a big set of these observers that have just uh, been released. Um, and something that's common to them is none of them kind of block the, 
the main thread, which was something that Philip uh, talked about just before, I think. Um, but be careful, because the callbacks of those observers do. So if you're going to run some heavy code in the callback, you're going to be hurting the performance as well. And what I think the main benefit is the API of these observers is very clean. So if we look at a very, uh, very simple one uh, that we use for ourselves is you're going to define an observer with some kind of uh, root component, which is your container. And you're going to have a, a margin, which can be a negative margin. It can be a positive margin, meaning if it's a positive one, before, if the element is already in the viewport, it's going to give you the offset, basically. And you can have a threshold, which can be an array of different thresholds. So you can have a callback execute when an element is half in the viewport or 30% in the viewport or whatever you want to define. And once you're done, you can just observe your images. In the end, when, when you get the observer callback, you're going to get the entries that are triggered and the observer itself. And you can just say, okay, it's intersecting, load the image, for instance. Lazy loading, maybe 200 milliseconds, 200 pixels before it gets on the screen. And that way you don't have to, to listen on the main thread. Um, and you can keep it idle and you can do your, your, your framework. Your framework can actually use those resources to, to do things. So there's a lot of these new intersection in observer APIs. One of them is intersection, resize observer, performance observer, and the mutation observer. All different kind of uh, specs and all different use cases. But they all have kind of common goals. Uh, so don't do work on the main thread, use the native APIs, and improve runtime performance, right? Those things shouldn't cost us, uh, cost us per, uh, resources. So cool. Uh, all that, uh, what now? Um, one day, uh, it was Anna from, from our business ops team comes up and says, hey, uh, the algolia.com slash product is loading slower in February than January. Okay. Uh, we had no monitoring in place. Uh, no monitoring of how things are changing. And I actually have a good story about that uh, just in a few minutes. Think about when we had, it happened to us. Uh, think about your website is not always something you control. Sometimes it's other people who can push data there, who can make pages on the fly, right? You don't want people to, to create a marketing page with, for instance, uh, a five megabyte couch. I'm not, I'm, it happened to us. Uh, one day I was looking at pages and just trying to find something. Um, and then I see this five megabyte uh, asset in, in the network. I was like, what? It can't be. And it was this pretty, pretty couch in high definition. Uh, it was just there. The thing is, you want to have some sort of uh, tests that are going to give you this. And so that was actually why we started to implement some of these things uh, for our users. And so we now have proper monitoring in place. Cool. But what was the, the actual impact on, on our users, right? So We've had, we've seen some things that we kind of think we can correlate. Um, we've had an increase in, in session time, a session duration, and we've had a kind of big drop in, in the bounce rate, right? Uh, it also allowed us to, to talk to other people and have a sort of an opinion on what we think is, is, is something that search performance should be. And as a search company uh, that advocates for a fast search engine, we can we can now be there with the fast websites and not be the people who have a slow website and not really standing behind something that they believe in. So thank you for, uh, for listening.